Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined today again by Mark Blitz, a professor of political philosophy at Claremont McKenna College, a teacher of mine way back many, many decades ago at, at Harvard, my first class I took there on Plato and, and Nietzsche, uh, both of whom feature prominently, uh, will feature, I think, somewhat in our discussion today. Uh, Mark's written books on, on Plato and Heidegger, uh, books on uh, liberal democracy and uh, liberalism, I guess someone might say. Um, and they all, in a sense, come together, I think, in, in your new book on reason and politics, the nature of political phenomena. So I thought we could talk about that and not about, about what's about the book or what's about what's discussed in the book, I guess. We don't need to, yeah. uh, people, of course, should go out and buy the book that goes without saying, but you know, can, absolutely. They, can, they can learn from this discussion, even if they don't happen to have read the book yet, or even maybe can see it, even though it's a horrifying thought, even if they're not planning on reading it in the very near, <laughs> in the very near future. Anyway, thanks, Mark, for joining me. My uh, pleasure. So this is a very, uh, very ambitious, dense, uh, but but clear at the same time, I'd say, readable uh, book. And it requires some study. Reason and Politics, the Nature of Political Phenomena. And so let me just begin with that. What is it? I mean, I guess normally one would think about politics and, you know, there are different, uh, they're the historical phenomena. Politics is, uh, is a political regimes or historical phenomena, political developments, and there's a lot we can say about that, and there are patterns maybe, but what does it mean to say that uh, political phenomena have a nature or that, and that somehow that's involved with reason and politics? Yeah, so, I mean, that's right. You think of, of politics often as quite, you know, contingent and, and dealing with changeable things. Um, so I wanted, what I wanted to do is really to, to examine how much you could say that's true <laughs> you know, reasonably true about uh, these basic phenomena such as uh, freedom and virtue and rights, what's good, what's common. And nature is, is kind of the, the correlative of reason. It's what reason wants to know, the way you might think of natural laws of physics. So the nature of political phenomena, as I try to uh, look at them, is what's reasonable, what's the reasonable ground or basis uh, behind all of these phenomena. And it, 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 the practical meaning of this, in a way, is that reason is the ground for agreement. At the end of the day, the only true ground for agreement among human beings is reason, what we share, speech, discussion, our fundamental uh, quality. Everything else ultimately is contingent and, and differentiating. So the point of the book is really to examine things theoretically, to try to understand what's true about them. But behind it is always that practical connection between what, what reason can discover and the grounds of, of agreement. So I, I thought about those issues a lot as I was working out uh, what I thought was true about these things. But I'd say for a book that, that is about reason and, uh, and politics and the nature of political phenomena, it doesn't, uh, you don't present it the way one might expect. I think someone who, uh, people who write books with reason in the title present things, which is sort of rationalist, you might say, argument, deductive argument, you know, natural laws, moral laws. It's, it looks more like a, I don't know if the right word is phenomenological, but you know, you're looking at political life and sort of beginning with how it appears to us, not with something you're deducing from some, some scheme or other of that, that reason has told you about. Yeah, no, that's quite true. And uh, I think it, and, and, and I do it that way, Pierce. I think that the way in which one begins to think about these matters uh, has to be in relation to uh, the first way you see them and experience them within your own way of life. So that you first see freedom and free actions and the good things you strive for in terms of a particular way of life and a particular context and I think that is how one has to begin and then push through from that as far as you can uh, to what's really more general and reasonable about them. And in doing that, I also had in mind uh, all of these views and arguments that we're limited in what we can say is true about things because of the context in which we begin, our economic class, our historical period, our identity and so on. And I wanted to think through, you know, what's true about that, but what's true about that in a way that also can open up to what's 
more uh, fundamental and reasonable and naturally true. So I think it's quite true to say that I begin and develop things in this phenomenological way, because that I think is the, the, the truth of how things first uh, appear to us and how we first experience uh, everything really. And I think you don't begin with, or don't appear to begin with uh, the history of political philosophy or, you know, people, you're a student of uh, uh, Harvey Mansfield and indirectly, I guess, of Leo Strauss. Did you ever meet Strauss? I can't remember. Uh, you know, the, the two times I was, I, I could have met Strauss didn't happen. One time he was supposed to come to, uh, to Wellesley, but I wanted to go back uh, to New York, uh, mm -hmm. see my, my then girlfriend, now wife. <laughs> Second time, it was when I was teaching University of Pennsylvania, he was coming to uh, a series that David Schaefer has at Temple and he, we were all set up at lunch and he was going to sit uh, or I was going to sit next to him. Wow. And then the time he had his fatal heart attack. <laughs> Yeah, they gave so, him the they gave him the lunch seating, and it was Mark Blitz, and he thought, "Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Uh, if, if it has to be much. this, if it has to be this, I'd rather just leave." I so we joke about I, this, but anyway. no, we shouldn't. Uh, but nonetheless, we just have. And, right. yeah, yeah. So I never did meet Strauss, but sure, of course, indirectly a student of Strauss. And uh, so he's, you know, one thinks of ancients and moderns. One thinks of you know, we approach these things through these great thinkers of the past and we uh, take seriously and, and read carefully and treat as if they might have, had a, they might have been correct. Um, and the, there's all, even the fancier kind of the cave beneath the cave where we have to kind of go back and we don't have access somehow quite to the natural phenomena. So we have to go back through this history to kind of get the clarity to even begin to think about it. I'm not saying that very well, but something like that. And but I wouldn't say your book it doesn't look like it begins that way, you know? And so yeah. say, a, say a word about that. I mean, yeah, no, it's true. It doesn't begin that way. I mean, at the very end of the book, right before the conclusion, I go through some of the ways in which the various political philosophers have understood human excellence or the best life. So do something a little bit from Plato on through uh, Nietzsche and then on to Heidegger as well. But I don't begin that way because I think that one can try to look directly at phenomena as long as you understand that your own way of life in the, our own way of life in the United States is already in a way theoretically formed. So that one has to have some sense of the way we understand good things as satisfying desires, as relieving uneasiness, as John Locke said, the way in which we understand freedom is fundamentally connected to rights, the particular virtues we have. So, I think you can take a direct look at what we are, but you have to always do that having in mind the way we in particular are so theoretically formed. You don't want to only look at the history of political philosophy because then you'll never really look clearly enough uh, at the phenomena themselves. And it, you know that's ultimately what one really wants to do to look at the phenomena directly. So I talk about the history of political philosophy some, and I talk about the way one can work backwards to the classical beginning. But it's also the case that you can begin by taking a hard look at, at rights and freedom and virtue, uh, see what we have of them now and see how they open up more broadly. That's at least the, the argument behind my procedure, you might say. You do have, you do have to liberate yourself from a, the perspective which one uh, sort of grows up in, so to speak, but but that's doable, I guess, is the argument. And, and one can then still see the things as it were, at least the images of the things themselves and not, not simply interpret text. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, the, I mean, Strauss himself uh, uh, sat in on some courses by, uh, that, that Heidegger gave, uh, studied some with Husserl as well, uh, who, who was Heidegger's teaching. So, you know, starting really with the turn of the 20th century and certainly after the First World War, um, there was a major attempt to try to take a look at phenomena directly, precisely recognizing that we have not often a direct look at these things because we're so theoretically formed. But the idea was to try to push away all of that theoretical obfuscation, you might say, and look at the phenomena more directly. But, you know, that's just not, uh, it's not something that's just true of our own time. If you look at the beginning of modern political philosophy, 
uh, Machiavelli, Hobbes, Locke, they try to push away some of what they thought of was religious obfuscation and the way in which the dominance of religious belief, not just uh, in the mind, but concretely politically as well, obscured one's uh, approach to basic phenomena. So one has to keep in mind the way in which uh, teaching and learning and doctrine uh, obscures one's approach, but ultimately one can do that and try to take a look at the, at the things themselves, which is really the, the, the point and sort of the, the formula, you might say, for the goal of Husserl Heidegger. And then in their own way, students of theirs, such as Leo Strauss, Jacob Klein, and others. Yeah, and it does, I mean, the book is a very, you begin often, I think it'd be almost each chapter with a kind of common sense account of what a certain term or concept means or how it appears to us. And then you go to the, try to dis, I guess, uh, unpack what's involved in that and uh, using political philosophy, but not, but always more using the political philosophers to help you understand as opposed to presenting it at least as understanding the political philosophers themselves, which is the more, the more typical Strauss maybe. So he more often seems to do that though, presumably it's ultimately, I think about the same enterprise, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, no, that's true. It's maybe ultimately the same enterprise, but I very much did want to do that. And that is how I begin um, almost all of the time with you know what we say about these things, what our current uses are, what do they mean? And that's, I think, a, a, a very useful way to begin if one really thinks through uh, the limits of what we say, the whole range of things we say, the various uh, points made in what we say. So if you think about what we mean when we say freedom or how we understand it or power and how we understand it, um, you can take a, a large first step to seeing the phenomena themselves rather than beginning with uh, what some thinker says. You know, even your understanding of what thinkers say is dependent on your own understanding of the phenomena they're talking about. You implicitly have some understanding of what they say. You implicitly have some understanding of the examples they use. You can't help but look at the things themselves, but then you need to really look at the things themselves and not just uh, return to sort of a half-baked understanding of things, which then becomes the ground of your understanding of these thinkers. So that's what I tried to do um, in this book. I mean, the chapters are called, so people get a sense, uh, the nature of political or practical action, the nature of freedom and rights, the nature of power and property, the nature of virtue, the nature of what is common, the nature of goods, and then there's a conclusion. I mean, so you do take these things that are very uh, central, obviously, to the common life, to political life, and try to uh, look at them from uh, different perspectives and, and see, again, what, what they have in common. But I, I was very struck also by how much you don't want to sort of simply reduce everything to one thing or, or uh, let the common overwhelm what's also separate, problematic, and, you know, uh, not simply reducible to sort of one formula, you might say, for each of these, for each of yeah, these concepts. That's, a, that's absolutely so, because... I mean, you know, part of my view is that the way freedom is varies a lot by the kind of regime or way of life one has, uh, you know, a, a classic aristocracy, a classic or modern uh, democracy, religious uh, ways of life. So the way these phenomena um, are uh, varies a lot. So you have to then try to think through how can you move from that to what's common, but without what's common becoming some vapid generality or some vapid universality, because that's not how these, these phenomena actually, actually have their meaning. And I also wanted to, 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 to keep alive the way in which these phenomena are, uh, are disputed, both theoretically and practically. I mean, you can't really understand what good things are unless you also see why we dispute them so much and why they uh, uh, appear differently in so many ways um, and how limited one is in some of the things that one could know. You want to understand in a way what's true, let's say, about equal individual rights, equal individual natural rights, but why it's not the whole or the only truth, why the other truth in a way are unequal 
uh, skills or abilities or use of one's freedom and how you can put those things together, but you know what the limits are of putting together in a, in a reasonable way some of those differences. So what I wanted to do is simply to look, about, look at things uh, as they are without uh, trying to push them together in some false ways. So maybe let's, you mentioned freedom and rights a couple of times, and that's the chapter, I suppose, that's sort of the topic, the subject that's most, that's closest to us naturally, so to speak. It's our regime, kind of. Um, so say, say, a word, I mean, say a word about that chapter and what you discovered or what you would argue um, about freedom and rights. We throw those words around so much and probably think we have a very commonsensical and uh, obvious understanding of them a lot of the time. So I wanted just to think through first what freedom is and then how rights are connected to that. And, you know, freedom, if you just look at some of the common uses and think them through, is some combination of being unobstructed, unblocked, unhindered, but also self-movement, right, self-direction. And what those things mean when you put them together are connected always to the things you're moving towards or the things you're you're not being hindered in seeking so that there are you know, significant differences between seeing good things as objects of, of nobility or perfection and rivalry in the way one might think of a, of a classic uh, aristocrat or, or classic aristocracy. Um, but there are also ways in which one thinks of what one is driving towards and is trying to be unhindered in, in seeking that are connected to goods simply understood as what satisfies desire. Differences between freedom is connected to what satisfies desire when everything can satisfy it equally and you're just adding up a variety of pleasures and freedom understood as driving towards and seeking to have and seeking to possess uh, good things where the pleasures connected to them can't all be added up because they're connected to the things themselves. You know, so the pleasure of food and drink is not the same as the pleasure of seeing something beautiful or seeing someone beautiful or understanding. So I wanted to think through those uh, elements of freedom, but also as connected to these various um, good things and ways in which you understand good things uh, that are at the heart of the basically uh, the different ways of life. And then I also wanted to connect that to a certain understanding of the human individual or the human soul. You know, starting with, uh, when you talk about self-directed and not being hindered or blocked, you have in mind some view of movement and moving. Um, and you can look at that as connected to love or eros in, in the platonic sense. Spiritedness is a kind of movement as well. So I wanted to think through the relation of freedom to you know, the human soul and the different ways in which the human soul and its powers express themselves. So I wanted to think all that through as much as I could and describe it uh, you know, at, at greater length and detail and complexity than obviously I just did, but along these lines, and then see the connection of that to human rights where there I wanted to see, can one naturally defend the existence of equal individual rights? Um, and then I turned to, to rights uh, and looked at it. I mean, I guess what struck me is I, one might expect and I, you know, one normally sees a kind of, even a sophisticated defense of freedom, which is, well, look, freedom is not the only good thing and, and uh, our regime prioritizes uh, freedom, if I can put it that way, and others, favor other things and but let's talk about freedom you know the regime based on freedom and then you analyze liberal democracy or whatever and declaration of independence and all that and um but i think what you do that so i mean i think we do justice to that side of the, the particular character of our regime but you i think want to say but correct me if i'm wrong that somehow you can't get away from all these other things that are real that are natural i guess these other goods these other uh, things one uh, desires or that show up in politics, let's put it that way, kind of neutrally, and that therefore even in a regime based on freedom, it's like you can't not discuss, you can't entirely bracket or put aside or not discuss virtue or or, or inequality or in a regime based on equality, you can't not discuss or not think about inequality and so forth. Uh, is that? Yeah, 
I think that's quite true. You've got to think about all these things. So when I turn to rights, I mean, the first question is, can you give a natural defense of the existence of rights? And I think when you look at it, you can see that anyone, if you look at yourself, you can see that you uh, have this ability to will, to choose, to reflect, and that that's there. That can't simply be taken away. You can block someone's ability to live that out, but it is there as such. And that's a, a fundamental um, truth, I think, about, about how, how human beings are. So it, it gives a ground of kind of generality or commonality or universality. Um, and, and it's much more, when you think about it, real and evident than things such as group rights or group identities, which are all somehow at some level made up and constructed, even if they have some historical truth. But individual rights uh, don't. They have this real truth about them. And they're a way of talking about or thinking through or understanding freedom because they're connected to this self-direction in particular. But then they're also kind of equal. I mean, they're the kind of freedom or self-direction which we all have equally. And therefore, at the other end of them, they're connected to the kind of good things that we can think of as what we can equally possess. So that fundamentally means things such as what satisfies desire, human pleasure, all of the things that are at the heart of, in a way, liberal democracy. When you think those things through, however, you see that there are other and more full and complete ways of thinking about what's good and of thinking about various ways of life and of thinking about human freedom. Um, so that there's truth in, uh, rights and liberal democracy, but they also open up to something uh, broader and more fundamental. Um, I also try to argue that uh, individual rights are connected to a certain reverence for oneself, grounded in one's pride and spiritedness, right? but grounded also in the things you seek and the things you love. Um, but again, that that's a, a, a kind of an equal version um, of what is nonetheless fundamental. Um, and then you also then, when you consider especially a whole community based on, on equal rights, ultimately, such as ours, you see that you need certain qualities of, of soul, certain power, certain abilities to actually exercise your rights. You need certain virtues. So there are certain qualities of character which fit together with liberal democracy and individual natural rights, uh, toleration, responsibility, industriousness, versions of these classical virtues that Aristotle talks about, courage and so on. So that there's a, a kind of character which also needs to be uh, uh, developed if you're really going to have a successful liberal democracy. Uh, and that also opens up ultimately maybe to something broader and broader ways of life as well. But even talking just about liberal democracy, a certain kind of excellence of character, a certain understanding and defense of individual rights uh, goes a long way toward showing uh, what's uh, desirable uh, about uh, our way of life, whatever its limits. So I have all of that in mind. And do you take, and I'll now oversimplify radically, I'm sure, but do you take what seems to be Hobbes's, you know, debunking of all that, a lot of that highfalutin stuff you were just saying and saying, oh, forget about all that glory and honor and, you know, and, you know, God knows piety and uh, we, have, we have these solidly based rights, uh, you know, based on equal fear of death or whatever and, and, uh, and our desires. Do you take that to be, polemical, but not quite what his, was his, what his considered view been closer to what you just articulated? Or, or is it just he had a certain slightly one-sided, if one could put it this way, view, and that you, you're, you're capturing the phenomena better than his, maybe intentionally, maybe not intentionally, you know, I don't know what lopsided, you might say, account or polemical account. Is that it? Uh, well, I, I'd hope his considered view would be closer to mine because that would make my view stronger. Yeah. Or based and better grounded. 
Um, yeah, I've always thought- I guess what I mean by the question is, I mean, so many, when you study the history of political philosophy, at least at some level, maybe this would fade away a little bit or be complex, obviously be more complex the more carefully one studied these thinkers, but they seem to be fighting each other about what you're sort of putting together, you know, they're, and they seem to have some interest in saying that, well, you can't quite put these things together. It's sort of, we need to defeat this to set up that, you know, yeah. like Welly and Hobbes need to defeat obviously what happened before them, uh, what was in the universities and so forth to, to set up the liberal, you know, state and, and all that. So uh, anyway, just so. Yeah, no, those are good points. And, and so I'll say a couple of things about that. There's certainly an attempt to, to, to substitute natural individual self-direction or natural individual authority, because ultimately a right is an authority to act and to choose. And as I said, you can see it's grounded in your individual will and choice and assertion. So there's an attempt to substitute that naturally grounded individual authority uh, for religious authority or for priestly authority. I think that's clearly so. And it's also the case that when you talk about equal authority and equal movement, you begin to move towards the goods and the pleasures that are more likely to be shared equally, therefore material comforts and satisfaction. So I think all that's so. But I also think that there is a strong uh, element of uh, pride and assertion and spiritedness in liberal democracy, which sometimes gets overlooked and precisely one reason is because of the way in which Hobbes uh, uh, discusses and develops his argument uh, in the Leviathan and in other works as well. Uh, there's a liberating or an attempt to liberate individual spirit and a kind of individual spiritedness in liberal democracy as well. Uh, the entrepreneur and entrepreneurialism and one's own, one's own self-direction and self-movement and one's own protection of oneself and defense of oneself. I think that element of, of, of spiritedness, but again, a more equal spiritedness uh, is a very important part of liberal democracy. It's not just low, but solid in the arguments that sometimes people make, uh, but it also captures through rights and through freedom, this element of spiritedness of uh, reverence for yourself, of in a certain sense, trying to live up to what you consider to be best in yourself, limited as those arguments might be. And that's part of the strength of liberal democracy. So uh, I think that's an extremely important element of it. Uh, maybe you see it more clearly in, in, in Machiavelli. Maybe you see it a little more clearly in John Locke when you look, maybe you don't. <laughs> But I would say that uh, that's a, a really vital part of understanding freedom and equal rights, and therefore what's high and worthwhile in liberal democracy. And you see it when you really think hard about what freedom is and what rights are, and think about them uh, conceptually and intellectually, and really try to discover the truth about them. And it seems to me, again, what's distinctive about your work is you try to think it too conceptually, but based on a sense looking at real existing human beings and real existing citizens in more or less real existing regimes and nations. And so in that respect, it's both more, I, I mean, I think you don't, uh, I mean, it's, I've always thought it's sort of a mistake for people to read whatever political philosopher they want to say was key at the founding and then just say, well, that's therefore what this actual country or set of nations even, or the last 200 years of history, is therefore explained. There's something just a little ridiculous about that when you, I think, when you think about it, honestly. And um, I mean, it exaggerates how much one could form everything in one way or another, unless human beings really could just be reformed by a thinker and don't have any, I guess this is the point though, right? You're making that they're not so easily simply reformed because they have a certain nature and therefore this, these certain things can rise or fall or be suppressed or be exaggerated, you know, enabled and exaggerated, but they're always, they're all sort of there and they take different forms and different eras. Is that a fair, a fair way? Of yeah. Saying? And you could also say, you know, we begin always from a certain kind of meaning or meaningfulness, a certain set of ends or goods and ways in which we understand good things. Again, let's say the satisfaction of desire or things as beautiful and complete. 
and we begin from a certain set of um, ways in which we seek those things and can approach those things, who can do what and what you need to do. We begin from a certain context and the, the, the deepest context usually is a regime or a way of life. But the concrete meaning of that changes over time. How we today understand liberty is not exactly the way in which we understood it at the founding. How we understand who can do what is obviously not the same as literally it existed at the founding given, uh, given the question and the presence of slavery, given the opening of uh, civic and other rights and activities for women and so on. So those, you've got to look at those things. You've got to look at the ground of the way of life, but then what the way of life actually means now. So I talk a little bit about what culture actually means. And that's what I think it ultimately means. It really the heart of a culture is the, 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 the changing ways still on the ground of kind of a founding principles, but the changing ways in which those are actually interpreted and the changing ways in which, in which who is allowed to do what and how one gets things done happen. I mean, you know, day-to-day -day life uh, has a lot to do with uh, the implicit ways in which you expect things to happen or not to happen the explicit ways in which you trust or don't trust the people you're dealing with all of the time. That's grounded ultimately, I think, in, in the, uh, the, the broader views of what's just and what's good. But in the ways I mentioned, it, it changes as well. So I also talk a bit about, about patriotism and the difference between a particular country uh, and a regime, and a regime broadly speaking, and how that enters into the way in which you have to understand things, without, however, that being so dominant, the body and what's changeable, that one loses the basic sense in which uh, the heart of political phenomena is what you can understand about them reasonably and through reason, and this that ultimately points to the connection and interconnection among these different ways of life and among these different activities and uh, their connection ultimately to what's permanent. So, you know, the permanent truths about political life or human life are there, but they have their meaning and effect and presence in all of these subtle ways, I think, which one needs to uh, understand if one really wants to understand uh, basic political phenomena, or even ultimately uh, concrete everyday life here and now. I mean, you, you say at different times, I think that uh, there's sort of two traps one can fall into as it were, a kind of uh, homogenizing of everything that materialism might be the most obvious example, and maybe not the only one of that, you know, sort of reduction to try, try to reduce everything to certain laws that don't change at all, uh, and that are kind of, can be ultimately simplified, I guess you'd say. Um, uh, on the one hand, and then a kind of the opposite, the sort of, you know, thousand flowers have bloomed throughout history, but they have nothing in common with one another. And they're just kind of interesting, fantastic, you know, uh, flowers each in their own right, but there's nothing uh, to be said that cuts across them, if I can, well, that's the best way to put yeah, it. Yeah, 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 no, those are two of the um, basic ways in which I think one can be wrong in thinking about things to try to reduce everything to some simple uh, universal uniformity, uh, let's say material laws would be one version or a kind of historical or economic determinism might be another virtue, uh, another version of that difficulty. Would but, a kind of moral law be a, a version of that too? Kind of a Kantian, you know? Uh, yeah, so I argue in the book against that because I don't think that that properly understands human virtue and human character and human choice. Um, it looks at morality in, in too universalistic and uh, equal and law-like a way to really, to really capture the to really capture the phenomenon. So yeah, I think one mistake is this kind of uh, washed-out universalism, you might say. Uh, another mistake is the one you pointed to: everything is too different to say anything similar. Uh, about things, and that's certainly not true when you really think things through. 
But it's also true that you can't very easily inflate things to some fancy notion of the good or justice with all those capital letters without really thinking that through and working your way down to see how those are operational, how they actually work in real choices and real life and real virtue and real regimes. Um, you don't want to make uh, understanding things too easy for yourself. You really have to look at things the way they are. Yeah, no, that's one of the great virtues of this book, I think, is that it reminds one as one works, works through it and tries to grasp a lot of the com complexities of it is that, yeah, there's, a, there's that temptation to make it easy on oneself. Do you think one or another of those uh, traps or tendencies is more characteristic of our time, more of a trap for students these days, the kind of universalizing on the one hand or the and homogenizing or the, I don't know what, the, what, what would the other one be, the you relativizing know, it, and, you know, kind of the... It's right. interesting for, for us now that it, it's both. I mean, it used, it, the first thing you, you want to say is, you know, we kind of universalize by making everything in some sense or other physical or material, the usual, the usual kind of arguments, reducing everything to some, uh, uh, some approach that broadly speaking, natural science knows the truth of, or these other versions of it, where you reduce everything simply to, uh, to class or to historical period. So there's still an awful lot of that, I think. But on the other hand, uh, you also have this tendency in which everybody thinks that their own identity and ultimately their own individuality, literally so, is so unique and so different that everybody needs to dance to everybody else's tunes all of the time. And ultimately that there's nothing common. And you, know, you see that direction obviously in uh, people's hypersensitivity um, in, their, in their excessive concern with their own unique identity uh, and their con excessive concern with what disturbs them individually. Uh, so, you know, we have both those tendencies um, in, in, in a serious way, uh, rather than uh, trying to think hard about what genuinely um, is common on the one hand and what isn't common and, and working that through. Um, I think that the, uh, the, the attempt to ignore the truth of uh, natural rights in our founding is maybe the, the single most immediate difficulty because it moves away from the proper understanding, I think, of what individuals are and what individuality is and what we can share. But you know, the greater danger changes all the time a little bit, but I think we have some of both now. Yeah, let's say a word about now, though, since uh, you do mention that in passing in the book, I'd say that it's harder at certain times to appreciate certain things. I mean, in an egalitarian age, probably harder to appreciate the arguments for any various forms of inequality and that they are not going away and that they will always manifest themselves in certain ways. And and so forth. And so you talk a little bit about, about that and about, if you call it political correctness, but a kind of uh, unwillingness to look at things as they are because of, you know, of current uh, desires not to offend people. You also mentioned very interestingly the we might be entering a kind of post-human moment with technology and biogenetics and so forth, but even so, or especially so, one has to understand, therefore, what's common and reasonable about uh, political phenomena and human phenomena. So that's all a big set of questions, I suppose, but say a word about the current moment as it strikes sure. you. Sure, I think, uh, you know, we're grounded still on egalitarian principles, either when they're truly understood or even if they're not truly enough understood, but this kind of uh, hypersensitivity that each individual has that uh, the way they are is simply unique. And that works against um, really understanding excellence. But there is excellence in art. There is excellence in thought. There is, and what does that mean? It means the full use of human abilities. And the full use of human abilities is connected to a fuller freedom and a fuller self-direction and a fuller understanding of what's good. It's difficult to make those arguments, both because of people's uh, hypersensitivity, but also because we're grounded in a kind of egalitarianism as well. Uh, so that's one thing. So it becomes more difficult for people really to uh, think hard about uh, 
making the best of themselves, but even what making the best of themselves actually means. That's one great difficulty and it makes it difficult to really think through and talk about these issues. Um, but it's also the case, having mentioned talking about these issues, that you know, when you're in a world where it's more difficult to say things or where you're attacked more, not just for what you say, but for the way you say it and the fact that you might bother someone because of the way you say it, or they may choose to allow themselves to be bothered, or they might pretend to be bothered, or any of the rest of that, it's much more difficult to discuss important matters publicly and clearly. And it's very hard to think clearly if you can't speak clearly, because there's only so much you can do on your own. You have to have all of the options and possibilities and ways of truly understanding freedom and justice and human happiness. You have to have them discussed. You have to have them presented. You have to have them argued out. Uh, unless you miraculously can come across all of this yourself uh, without the aid of anyone else. And no one is like that, even Plato. <laughs> uh, so it, 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 th those are great difficulties, I think, in truly thinking things through. Well, what you have to do, therefore, is make the case for, when you have the opportunity, the possibility of real excellence. Uh, you have to be willing to uh, talk about things in reasonable ways when you're discussing important matters of education and politics. Um, uh, you know, you have to speak the truth as you see it, uh, prudently sometimes, of course, but nonetheless speak the truth as you see it. So I think all those things are important. Um, questions such as artificial intelligence or all the ways in which we can change our characteristics, you know, put, you might say, an extra premium on thinking through what we really are and what's good about us. Otherwise, you run the risk of ending it permanently or almost permanently by um, not understanding the qualities that really matter and the conditions connected to what really matters and not really understanding what's fully excellent. So I think about that uh, some in the book and, and talk about uh, human height and excellence um, and the way in which the ways in which we could change ourselves don't fundamentally change what is excellent uh, and what it means, but could change our ability to really understand it and, 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 and live up to it in various ways. And I talk about and think through the limits of physical, or as we would call them, maybe materialistic understanding of how things are uh, and how the full human things have their own independence. And so I think it's important to, to really grasp that. So, you know, there are a lot of dangers out there now in terms of understanding what's excellence, in terms of uh, speaking about things truly, in terms of what we can do with ourselves and not understand uh, what we really should be doing. Um, and that's, that's one of the reasons I thought uh, it would be useful uh, to think about the things I, I think about and write about them in a certain way in, in, this, in this book. I mean, on that last point, that's very helpful, I think, for me at least. Uh, on that last point, that gets me to a question that I've, I had reading the book, and I'm, I hope I can put it uh, into, you know, somewhat intelligently and intelligibly, which is, um, and one could argue, let me just put it this way, uh, that, and this is a standard conservative argument almost, that, you know, human beings don't change, and it's these progressives who think people get nicer, that's ridiculous. And so the human character has a certain character, the human body and the human psyche or soul, whatever term you want. And that what you're doing here, therefore, is thinking through all these different ways in which human beings can assemble themselves in politics and different permutations with different emphases on certain characteristics and virtues and stuff. But it seems to me you want to say a little more than that. I mean, it's not just a kind of, well, gee, the for whatever random reason, the psyche is structured this way. And so I'm going to now deduce interesting things about it from it being structured this way, but that somehow it is, there's more of a nature to it than just the accidental way that human nature is or, or came to be, uh, however it came to be really, it doesn't matter in, that, in this argument, I don't think. Or, or another way of saying it, I've often thought of the music, you and I both like classical music. I mean, the, the musical analogy is, I mean, Mozart is great because 
I guess our brains are set up in some way that we understand, you know, we resonate to, we appreciate, you know, the way in which all kinds of things happen in music that, you know, even if you haven't studied music, you have some sense of that this is an appropriate ending to a, you know, whatever resolution to a certain key and all that kind of thing. Is that simply because our brains are that way? Or is it because somehow that's based on a sort of natural shape of things that goes a little bit beyond just the way human beings happen to be? I would say that it's both together. It's not simply ever our brains and it's not simply the, the, the outside things. It's the way in which things are intelligible to us or have meaning to us. Uh, the way they have meaning to us is not simply in our own control. And on the other hand, we couldn't simply invent all of the ways in which things have meaning to us. So it seems to me that the, the better way to think about these issues than merely kind of human consciousness separate out there, structured in a certain way, um, and things being what they are, simply having nothing whatsoever to do with the way we think about them, is that it's really the, in a way, the interconnection. Uh, and that really is the heart of meaning and intelligibility. So um, I think in, in Mozart's music is beautiful <laughs> and you can discuss what beauty means and make clear uh, how it's beautiful. Um, but on the other hand, it's also the case that much of the development and working through of that beauty and experiencing of that beauty uh, has to do with us and our being there and has to do of course with Mozart himself <laughs> and Mozart's being there. So. I'd say it's, you can't really understand uh, some fixity, fixity in human beings without seeing the whole p political community, the way in which we experience our freedom, the way in which we experience what is good, the way we develop uh, those differences. Um, I think that uh, how we begin, um, you know, what is your understanding of children? What is the way in which children are educated? What is your understanding of the relation between men and women? What is the family as you actually experience it? Uh, that has a lot to do with uh, how fully you can actually develop your skills and talents and understand things. So all of those differences I think are very important. Uh, and they don't simply, they're not simply reflections of uh, some universal truth which exists, you might say, nowhere, <laughs> and uh, and and in 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 a way in which uh, you don't see it any place in particular. Um, the human things uh, have a generality, but they also necessarily have a, a particularity, uh, and I would say it's it's in a way both of those things together. Fundamental, ultimately, is what you can talk about as, as, as more general and universal. Maybe still another way to say this is that one could argue, and I do argue, that there's a certain peak for uh, human excellence, and two versions of it are the, the philosophical life, as the classics see it, and uh, uh, ethical or practical virtue, as the classics see it. Other human activities and ways are in a certain sense declensions, you might say, from that. But even to talk in terms of those peaks and the way in which they use the mind and the way in which they deal with all of the good things we seek and passions we seek, you can't understand that without talking specific ways you're thinking, specific forms of government, specific political activities. Otherwise, I think they don't have that kind of political and human meaning. So in a way, it's both of those things together, the general and the specific, you might say. But I suppose, I mean, Strauss says somewhere that you might think that if, if, thinking things through, being philosophic could be Sisyphean, if there were nothing more to be discovered than, you know, somehow random chance, somehow there is something about the nature of nature that supports or enables, though not directly. I mean, there was not, it's not a sort of, that uh, allows for, I guess, a certain kind of human uh, understanding. And 
grasping, right? I mean, that somehow that's, I think you imply that in, in the book. Sure. I mean, look, you can't, it, it, there are lots of things you can say about what's truly good and what a high human life is. I think there are lots of things that you can say that, that are correct about all those things. Uh, to really understand them, you have to look at them at play in certain ways of life and in certain activities. Um, but nonetheless, you can basically and fundamentally understand them. Um, you can see something of what beauty is by looking at, um, let's say, one of Mozart's uh, last symphonies. Um, uh, so uh, obviously there's a, a, a connection between human understanding and what's there to be understood. Uh, it's not simply an imposition by us. Right. And it's not simply that things are meaningless. We always begin in some realm of meaning where things are intelligible to us in some way or other. That's how things are. That's part of what I mean by saying there's a connection between the things that we're not and what we are, because we begin always in some sense of, with some sense of meaning and intelligibility and a view of ourselves uh, and what we seek, but those things differ in various, in various ways of life, but they're there. And one can work from that uh, to a fuller and broader understanding, even though there are certain uh, issues or questions which are hard to resolve fully. Um, one political example, it, it, it's, it maybe it's not possible fully to resolve in a political community these two truths of equal natural rights, the way in which we are equal and have a pride or spiritedness, uh, something deserving of reverence, each of us, all of us, one thing, but also this different degree of excellence, these different ways of life, this different level of powers we have, this different level of abilities we have. I think both of those things are true, but you know, what is the political order that can put them together perfectly? Um, and the answer is there's no political order that can put them together perfectly. You can just uh, do the best you can. And we've done pretty well, a high version at least of liberal democracy with true virtues of responsibility and a real openness at least to the possibilities of excellence. Uh, is a reasonable practical solution, but I don't think you can, you know, put together exactly those two truths in a in, in a kind of political perfection. So that's not Sisyphean uh, practically, but it it shows a limit. And there's certain things intellectually, I think, of that sort also. Yeah, it seems on the intellectual or I guess I don't know epistemological side or so whatever however you'd want to say it. The uh, yeah, we're not simply imposing, as you say, but we're not, nor are we simply downloading, I guess, would be the, the opposite, right? Sort of a substance out there, we just kind of, you know, discover it, and then it's all resolved. And somehow that the true, true understanding is neither, neither simply human assertion, nor, you know, it's, you know uh, sort of two plus two equals four, and, and that, that's sort of the pattern for everything, right? Yeah, I think that's up because you, things have to have a meaning and an intelligibility for you even to begin to think about them. And you begin with a certain meaning or intelligibility of things, and that's the openness maybe to how things are, are, are truly intelligible and, 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 and truly have their meaning. But it's not simply a downloading in that simple sense. Another thing to say is that, is that you know, things reveal lots of their true powers only once you've done something what, with them. Um, mm. Plants are plants, but you don't discover their medicinal powers until you try to do something with them medicinally until you look at them in a certain way, until they have a certain meaning and intelligibility. So most things, you're not inventing that, but on the other hand, they come to life, you might say, only together with, with, with human effort. And there are all sorts of um, concrete powers of things, uh, concrete properties of things, which really are brought out and come to light and are experienced only together with human beings. So we don't invent them, but they also don't have their full meaning and effect and power without us. And I think that's true of all sorts of things, in fact. So um, it's neither the downloading nor the made up imposition, but again, it's, 
you know, there's a world of meaning and intelligibility, but much of that is really brought out uh, and allowed to have its power uh, only together with us, with the human. That's helpful to me. And then it's allowed to have its, brought out and allowed to have its power in different ways and different regimes. So that further complexifies. Yeah, and that exactly so that further complexifies things. So that to take the example of plants and certain kind of regimes, uh, certain trees are there only to be looked at by the aristocrat on the aristocrat's estate. Uh, not so in our regime, uh, and that's true of all sorts of things because of of questions of human equality, questions of property, what can be bought, what can be sold, what can technology. be technology, yeah. technology, what can be worked on questions of religion and the proper way in which you do things, whatever the result, right? So that makes things even more complex, but that complexity uh, is part of the way things are, but nonetheless, you can work from that complexity to see ultimately in a way the, 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 the truer things that uh, the way of life reflects. Uh, and the ground of, of, of human powers and abilities. Um, in a way, that's part of the, the, the argument or the procedure um, in the way in, uh, of, in this book. Let me close or almost close by asking you about um, maybe, well, two thinkers in particular, uh, Plato and Heidegger, about both of whom you, you wrote books, um, both of whom are pretty uh, prominent, I'd say, in this book. I mean, they seem to maybe more than most, almost every other thinker, uh, other thinkers kind of inform the argument and you, you cite them many times, obviously, but even when you don't cite them. Um, at the end, you have this wonderful account of the history of political philosophy in a very brief uh, sort of synopsis, you might say, in terms of how each of the major, well, each, but many of the major thinkers view excellence. And But um, so I'm just curious about Plato and how, I mean, are, is the book somehow, uh, you know, do Plato and Heidegger have a special status in your mind, at least, in terms of what you've learned and do they simply and how do you, what about the kind of confrontation or yeah. the between them and so forth? Yeah, so thanks uh, for what you said about that, <laughs> that part at the, uh, near the end of the book. Yeah, I, to me, the, an important question is how can one somehow account for what seems to be true in Heidegger but on the grounds fundamentally of a platonic understanding. Uh, the danger or difficulty of Heidegger, everyone knows now, is the association with the Nazis, which is not an accident, uh, but which is somehow connected to his thought. And yet there's so many fundamental things about how human beings are, what we are, about uh, what other thinkers know and understand, so, so much in Heidegger that one would like to see if it's possible to recapture some of that um, in a platonic or natural understanding. Um, so that's something that I also had in mind. When I think of um, everything is beginning in a certain context of intelligibility, that's very much connected, you could say, to some of Heidegger's understanding of things having their meaning within what he calls a certain world and human beings as fundamentally having characteristics in terms of our openness to meaning and therefore to being. But then when you look at Plato and Aristotle, you see that in a way, the fundamental concrete ground of meaning and intelligibility in action is the way of life or the regime or the political regime. So one of the questions I ask myself, is there a way in which you can understand what Heidegger sees in terms of meaning and intelligibility and this interconnection between human beings and how we are situated so that it's neither something which is, as you would say, downloaded or simply imposed. Is there a way in which one could understand that? But working from the Platonic uh, and Aristotelian understanding of the political order as the heart really of, of fundamental meaning and then the way that opens up to uh, virtue and the way that opens up to philosophical reflection, even beyond itself. So in a way that was um, a kind of intellectual task that I always had in mind. If it didn't happen, it didn't happen. 
And, you know, it's certainly possible for someone to read the book and say that um, um, it hasn't happened. <laughs> but I, that was very much something that I, 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 I wanted to think I wanted to think through, could one capture what's true in Heidegger, um, but on grounds which are not Heidegger's grounds? Um, and you wanted, I mean, to investigate that in an open-minded way, or you wanted to reassure yourself that Heidegger couldn't quite be, <laughs> that, that there was no fundamental breakthrough by Heidegger because that would then be unnerving given his politics or is yeah. that... No, I try to investigate it in a completely open-minded <laughs> yeah. open way. Uh, Just to know, make that clear, you're not... Yeah, so yeah, no, sure, thank you. Politics doesn't mean that he couldn't be right about a million, about a lot of things. Of course, just as the fact that one would like to show that there is some basic truth about equal natural rights doesn't mean that one is able to show those things. So, you know, having all those kinds of issues in the back of one's mind, you need to make sure that they don't... Uh, skew your understanding so that you don't see things as they actually are. So, yeah, I uh, uh, would not let or tried hard not to let uh, the way things, uh, the way I wanted things to be, right. try to confuse that with the way things actually are. Um, you know, that's, that's important. But I also had a variety of these of these things in the back of my mind. And that is helpful in uh, attempting to see things the way they, they, they genuinely are. A variety of different thinkers, you mean? I had a variety of different thinkers and I had a variety of different questions. What is the relation between equal natural rights and unequal excellence? What can one say about um, physical or material explanations? And what are the limits of those things? How can you understand the different thinkers and their different understanding? How can you understand the different forms that freedom takes, that human movement, eros and spiritedness take? How can you understand all those things? So I had a lot of those questions in mind as I was looking at these phenomena. And I think if you have enough of those questions and issues in mind, maybe it helps not um, having things come out the way you want them to come out. Uh, basically, I had no way in which I wanted them to come out fundamentally, but of course, to begin with, I had a few things that I would prefer, <laughs> uh, such as what we just discussed with Plato and Heidegger. And I just, this is somewhat irrelevant, I suppose, but how did you, I sort of think I can understand how you got so interested in Plato, but where, why, how did Heidegger happen? Just curious as an actual biographical matter, so yes. to speak. Yeah. When did you encounter Heidegger? He's been so much in your mind since I met you, certainly, and you were working on Being in Time, and, and which became your first book. And uh, was that a course? Was it just your own reading? What, what was it? Uh it, it goes back to what we were saying about Leo Strauss. I, it, it, you know, it, it sort of became clear from looking at Strauss that Heidegger was the most important contemporary think, uh, thinker, the most central thinker, and the one who posed the greatest challenge and set of questions uh, to classical thought or even to liberal thought. So I thought that if I really were to try to understand things, I had to come to grips with Heidegger. Um, so it was, it was simply for that reason. Um, there wasn't any course and, you know, few people looked at Heidegger in terms of the kinds of questions I was asking at that point. There had always been an up and a down in terms of how people understood his association with the Nazis, but very few people understood the thought as somehow connected to it. And I thought that might be the case. So that's how I really looked the reason why I look seriously at Heidegger, and once one does that, you see all these things that you do, you do learn from him. So, but that's, that was the cause of it biographically. Uh, and um, I think it was, as it turned out, worthwhile to say the least intellectually to really come to grips with him. I'd written my dissertation on Plato, Plato's Statesman. So I had thought through a lot of the statement as well. And interestingly enough, though I didn't really know this at the time, there's some real connection between Plato's Statesman and some of Heidegger's being in time, uh, you know, that I noticed uh, as I was working through uh, being in time. Well, this is a great, the book's a great accomplishment. I hope this conversation will 
uh, lead people to read it and study it and think about it and challenge it if they if they wish. What's your it seems like almost such a summum that uh, that I, you're, you're you're healthy and young by our standards now. So <laughs> you know what's next, or uh, you're gonna. Um, uh, yeah, I've got I've got two things in mind. Uh, I, I I wrote a book as you said on Plato, Plato's political philosophy, and it's occurred to me that maybe a general book on Aristotle might be useful. There are wonderful books on the ethics, on the politics. Um, uh, uh, good things on the rhetoric as well, but perhaps a, a general book uh, on, on Aristotle would be useful. Um, so that's one thing I'm thinking about and working on. Also, a kind of more general book on German thinking from Kant to Heidegger. I think more likely that would could be a real hard look at Hegel, uh, another thinker of supreme gifts and supreme importance. Uh, so those two things, as it stands right now, are, would be the major projects. And then together... That would be good. That would be good. I've, I might not have studied any of these people seriously. I can give them a <laughs> super amateur opinion that Aristotle and Hegel always seem to me to have the appearance of being clearer than, let's say, Plato and Heidegger, who takes uh, their, uh, the obvious examples, but actually to be more mystifying when you really look, think about them, especially Aristotle, which is such a, I think, a fake kind of clarity, you know, <laughs> if I could put yeah. it that way. And uh, yeah, they, no, that's true. He's, he has this great common sense, but also this immense difficulty when you really think it through and how he develops himself. And Hegel looks difficult to people, but in fact, there's a certain immediacy and, and clarity there as well, though ultimately, of course, very mystifying. So, um, yeah. Good. Okay, well. Maybe I could do some good if I actually uh, do at least one of those things. We'll I encourage you to do that, and we'll have a con we can have another conversation even before you finish your work on Aristotle or Hegel. Yes. I yes, your you. books on liberal democracy, I think, which are collect one of which is I think a collection of essays more, but then the other more of a book. Well, yeah, I, both coherent. Yeah, they're both the responsibility book, duty bound responsibility in American life. It, I, it, it's I. I, all of the chapters that are connected to it, I wrote having the book in mind, but some of them are separately presented. So they re I really wrote it with a unity in mind rather than as a kind of loose, loose collection of essays. And that's really my book on, uh, on liberalism, you might say, uh, practically. And then it ends with a chapter on John Locke, who I think is the central thinker uh, behind liberal democracy. And then I wrote a small book conserving liberty, which is more political in a way. Right. But I think the duty bound book really has a, people would benefit a lot from that if they haven't looked at it, because it does do, seems to me to do justice to certain aspects of liberal democracy that are often overlooked by our friends in particular, perhaps. But on the other hand, does justice in a serious way, not in a sort of edifying or wishful way, you know, which is also a bit of a tendency of some of yeah. our friends, perhaps. So. Yeah, one works, one wants not to be edifying, though, as one says, sometimes there's something necessarily edifying about, about some of this work, but you don't want to let the wish to consciously edify dominate the way you think, and even to some degree the way you write. That's a very good note to end on. So, Mark, thank you for taking the time today, and I really appreciate your work, obviously, and your teaching over the years, but uh, I appreciate you joining me for this conversation. Thank you, Bill. My pleasure. And thank you for joining us at Conversations.